So I mentioned the MACC before in the introduction class, but uh, just to recap that MACC is a consortium that is in the energy department. We're extremely fortunate to have them. I worked for the MACC actually for a number of years. It is the leading academic industrial consortium related to process control and process systems. Uh, no other university really has a collaboration quite as effective as MACC, and in fact, MACC is its 25th anniversary this year. So it's stuck around for so many years because the companies that uh, spend money on MACC really get value for it. So <coughs> what happens is that these member companies come and they bring projects to the, to the consortium and students work on them, and they're not just grad students. There's opportunity here for undergraduate students as well. So that's what this slide is about. Um, if you would like to get involved with some of these projects, with some of the professors, Dr. Nashkos, Dr. Schwartz, Adams, and Dr. Yu, they're all accepting students uh, for, for summer work. So there's the USRA, the UTRA application that you go through. Um, now there's obviously it aligns very much with the professor's interests. There's Dr. Dr. Um, Nashkos' research interests range from the fairly theoretical, as he's put up here, to those with more applied projects. So Dr. Mash has worked with Johnson Controls and Praxair on some interesting projects related to building air conditioning and building heat system management. Um, it, is, it is a research project, so it is an interview that is going to test your uh, ability for fundamentals. So it's an interview-based process, it's not a written test. Uh, so an interview with Dr. Mashkar, or what you are encouraged to do is to speak with some of these previous students who've gone through the process. So, uh, if you know James Scott or Brian McCall, please uh, contact them in Harry Potter. You post that on your website? I'll post this on my website. I'll put these slides up. Yeah. Um, so just uh, Tom Adams then has asked to put these slides up. These some of his projects that he's had in the past. So they're related to software development in many cases, a lot of small optimization, artificial neural networks, and then a game development. Any questions that I can take on this? I don't know if I can answer them. Any questions? Great, okay, so, yes. No, I don't think there is. I think uh, the best is, the question is if there's a minimum average requirement, uh, speak to the individual supervisors. But supervisors are far more excited to work with someone who wants to do the work. And I think technical competence is obviously some issue, but far more important is that you actually want to do it. Okay. So, so uh, please speak with any of the MACC supervisors on the matters you have uh, to match on. Thank you. Okay, so this evening's class then, uh, we'll continue a bit with the theory. Um, so theory is the one thing we can't escape with this particular course. And we ended off last night's class by looking at an example of benzene being reacted in a reversible form to go to diphenyl and diphenyl. So let's just recap with two molecules of benzene in a reversible reaction with diphenyl and diphenyl. Or to be working reversibly So we have that rate straight uh, those rate constants KB for the forward reaction and K negative B for the reverse reaction. Okay. And we ended off last night by showing the rate constant as uh, the equilibrium position, KC this is the equilibrium constant. The ratio of the reactant species at the equilibrium. So the concentration of the species at the equilibrium is what the curly ratio represents. The, rate con uh, the equilibrium constant is also, in fact, the ratio of the forward and the reverse rate constants. So KB divided by K minus B. And it's a value greater than zero by definition. Since the elements that make up that calculation, the concentrations are positive quantities as well. Now, we call this the equilibrium constant, but it is not constant. 
equilibrium constant very much is a function of temperature. So AC, so this is the new, the new material for this evening. So this is where we ended off yesterday. And we also showed, in fact, last night that if we derive the rate expression for the forward and reverse equations, that the rate expression, when we set the rate expression R to zero, which is the very definition of what equilibrium is, that at equilibrium nothing is reacting anymore. So the rate of reaction and the rate of consumption is equal to zero. When we set that equal to zero, we show that we put them back, we achieve or obtain the, the same equilibrium constant. So calling it an equilibrium constant is a bit of a misnomer. Kc is a function of temperature. And the relationship that we typically model it with is the von Wolf equation. So Kc as a function of temperature is equal to Kc at some reference temperature T1 multiplied by the exponent of the heat of reaction divided by the gas constant R, 1 over T1 minus 1 over T. So T1 is the reference temperature. Heat of reaction is negative for exothermic and positive for endothermic reactions. By the way, our previous instructors for, for 3K just um, make you read chapter 3 and you don't have to So we're, we're going on a recap. There's some points I want to emphasize in, in here. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm actually going through this material. Operate an endothermic system to obtain your product. <coughs> High temperature. So, where does that come about? How do we derive it? We call that the Chatelier's principle. Um, but whenever you get something like this, take a minute and look at that ex expression. Try to understand how it could be used in a variety of contexts. T1 is a reference temperature, let's say 25 degrees C. Heat of reaction is a number that's either positive or negative. <coughs> R, positive quantity. T1, measured in kelvins, positive quantity. So these are positive quantities. Kc, we've already said here and emphasized that it's a positive quantity. So what does the plot of Kc as a function of temperature look like? One of the things to understand to get to that point is to try and decode what the plot of this temperature dependency looks like. So what you can do and should do in MATLAB or um, any software package that you prefer to use is go and plot what this <coughs> section of the graph looks like. So let me, uh, let me just show that to you. So that would look like 1 over T1 minus 1 over T. It looks as follows, something along those lines, over a range of temperatures, and it crosses your x-axis at the T1 point. So clearly when T is equal to T1, this term here is equal to 0. And our temperature is using the Kelvin scale, so we're only dealing with positive values of T. So this shows me that at high temperatures, this term gets large. At low temperatures, this term gets small. For an exothermic reaction, then, what is the plot of Kc versus temperature? If temperature is Kc. Kc is always a positive quantity, so I don't have to go to the negative y-axis. Temperature, positive quantity, is only deal with positive numbers. So, for an exothermic reaction then, what would that plot of 
here. As temperature increases, would KC go up or down? Or an exothermic reaction? KC would go down. So you can show it to yourself, uh, would it go down in a linear form or would it go down in some other way? So is it going to go straight down? Down. Maybe. Okay. Before exothermic reactions, we have a general shape. All of them. Endothermic reactions. The key point is that we don't have this, it doesn't go up to infinity and just keep going. Right, it does settle out at some point. Because here, this plot of T shows that it, it will, it's a parabolic type function or a hypo, hypo, hyperbolic type function. So it doesn't keep going up to infinity. Or it will eventually, but it's at a diminishing rate. So it's the same. When we're taking the exponents of that, there's a positive or negative here, depending on our heat of reaction sign. That's a positive quantity. This is a positive quantity. So this very much agrees with the Chandelier's principle that says at high temperatures, our Kc is going to go get smaller and smaller. So for the exothermic reaction, let's make the note here at high temperature, Kc drops off. Okay, so we're going to produce less products. Our equilibrium is going to be have a lower concentration. So for exothermic reactions, um, we must remove heat. that reaction forward. <coughs> so we must remove the heat from the system to drive that reaction forward and generate products. <coughs> the reverse obviously applies to an endothermic system. So an endothermic system, we must provide energy into the system in order to, to, grade, to get a greater concentration of final product. So that gels with what we've learned, but we've kind of just learned these as rules, but there is a principle behind it. This equation system here uh, shows that to us numerically. It's also a great way to establish this equilibrium constant at different temperatures. So many, uh, remember we, at the start of the course, we said we've got a few degrees of freedom and control as engineers when we design the plant and when we operate it. When we design the plant, we can pick the temperature as we run the reactor. We can pick the volume of the reactor. Once the plant is built, we have fewer degrees of freedom to us. We can't change the volume of the reactor anymore, but we certainly can change the flow rates and the temperature at which we choose to operate the system. This equation here is going to tell me, for an equilibrium system, what that temperature effect is going to be on the final concentrations of our products. Okay, so important that we understand this, understand this principle. This is going to be critical for your project when you design your reactor over there. This is the selection of operating temperatures and temperature. So if Kc is not constant, it's also clear then that my rate terms over here, these terms that we call rate constants, are not constant. Okay, so filled with the Unusual terminology, we've got rate, uh, an equilibrium constant that's not constant, we've got rate constants that are not constant. <coughs> if Kc is varying, clearly Kb and K minus B are also varying. So, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Whiteboard marker section in the bookstore. Okay. <laughs> it's an acetonic 
Yeah. If, you, if you take a whiteboard marker and write over top of yeah. it, yeah. And then, then you can erase it. We'll dissolve. Uh, yeah, I'll do that manually. <laughs> So let's take a look where we were. So we've got these rate constants that are not constants, equilibrium constants that are not constants. of the catalyst, it's also a function of the other species that are around it, but to a very weak extent. By far, the greatest effect on Kb is the temperature. So, when you're used to writing things, for example, Kb is equal to, let me emphasize the temperature dependence, Kb is equal to the pre-exponential factor times e to the minus activation energy of Rt. So, we, I used this in the assignments previously. So A is my pre-exponential factor, EA is my activation energy, R the gas constant in, in SI units. So let me just emphasize that EA's units are joules per mole. The units of KB are the same as the units of capital A, and the units of KB and A are totally dependent on the rate expression. So K, that rate constant, there's no single set of units that are co uh, consistent amongst all, all reaction systems. So KB's units vary from case to case. And the idea of an activation energy is, um, it's apparent from chemistry, is that it's the energy required to get this reaction working. And it's typically for, yes? Um, is there KB units varies for physical reaction? what, like, yeah, so this term yeah, has no units. And A's units will be the same as KB. It always vary in every situation. So if it's a first order rate, it's going to be 1 over time. If it's a second order system, it's going to be concentration over time. So, um, the, where I was going here is let's the, the need for the activation energy is apparent when we consider that the molecules, when they come together to react, so in a system of A plus B going to C, that molecule of A and molecule B need to come together. There's repulsion between the two from the electron cloud. There's shape effects, or what the textbook calls steric effects, as these molecules need to come in and push against each other and, and form, <coughs> form the place for the reaction to occur. So, that's our activation energy requirements over there. You're used to seeing this illustrated in chemistry courses. For example, if we consider the reaction A plus B, C goes to A, B, C, and then that will react to create A, B plus C. So we start with our two reagents over there and we end up with that type of product, and it goes through this intermediate stage where A, B, and C are decoupled from each other. And you've probably seen drawings along the lines of this, that this is your base state here of A and B, C, the energy of A plus B, C. At the peak is where we've got A, B, and C dissociated from each other. So that height there is my called my energy barrier, and it's strongly related to the activation energy. And in fact, in most cases, we just call that the activation energy. Then A, B, and C come together, they react, and they'll form these final products here, A, B, plus C. And then that residual energy is our heat of reaction. So we've gone from a system of A plus B, C to the final system. It has a final status of lower energy. It's going to release so we can find what that heat of reaction is by plotting a special plot of Kb versus 1 over T on log axes. 
So this is a, have you done this in chemistry courses where you find activation energies experimentally? Um, if you haven't, it's, it's quite easy to understand why this works well. If I take a look at this expression over here, I take the log of both sides, I plot the log of Kb over the log of temperature. And what I will obtain then is a plot that has negative slopes <coughs> that represent minus E A over R. So I can then, R obviously my gas constant, I can then calculate what my activation energy is from that slope. So I can do a number of experiments and fit these data points to a best fit line on, on, the, on the log axis. <coughs> what are typical activation energies? Any rough guesses? What are typical numbers you've seen for activation engines? 10s, 5,000, 120 kilojoules per mole. Would you see a number of 5,000 kilojoules per mole? Sure. No. Okay, so a high value is something between 200 and 400. Values of activation energies of the chemical processes that occur in our bodies are in the order of 20 to 40. Okay, it's good that they're so low because it means that we don't accelerate our life. Our life, the rate at which your body ages and progresses depends very much on the activation energy. So a very low activation energy for cellular processes, for enzymatic processes, wastewater treatment plants work at a very slow rate. That's why they're, they're so big. So EA, small for these typical life cycle type systems. And they're also at room, at room temperature, those, those activation engines, for the medium order of 20 to 40 kilojoules per mole. So EA is temperature sensitive as well. And we, we saw this in a previous uh, assignment question where I asked you to consider a system with milk and, and uh, pasteurization. But essentially, we can recognize that K at some temperature, call that T0, equal to A e to the minus activation energy of RT0. And I can divide it by K at some other temperature, and I can get cancellation here. Yeah. So once we know K at, some, at one temperature, I can calculate what it is at another temperature. So this simplifies then to K at some temperature, is K at my reference temperature <coughs> equal to okay, So we can always uh, find these find these rate constants at other temperatures when we've got them at one reference condition. Okay, so let's see where we're heading so far. So far, we said our whole aim is, let's back up, this is now quite a bit of a backup. Our whole aim is we would like to understand what the rate is as a function of conversion. So our whole reactor design depends on minus RA is equal to some function of conversion. If we can plot RA versus conversion, we can design any reactor, a plug flow reactor, a batch reactor, or a CSTR. So far, we've looked at rates minus RA as a function of temperature. That's what we've just considered now. And then last night, we considered the part where it's the function of concentration. So our rate expression is always a, a function of two parts. If possible, we can break it down as a function of temperature and as a function of concentration. We considered that part last night. We just considered here on the whiteboard that section. But we haven't yet made the link to conversion. Neither of these are a function of conversion. That's where we're going to next. So ultimately what we're going to end up with is a system where well, this is a rather um, 
ultimately we, we want minus Ra as a function of temperature and inversion. We're never going to get rid of temperature's effect there, but we do want conversion <coughs> there. We don't want concentrations there. So my next step now is to show you how to convert the concentrations that we've used last night over to conversions. This is going to be your key design expression for, for your course project and for reactor design. We're going to pick up temperatures and we're going to pick up conversions and plot rates for the class through the reactor design. Why don't we always, why don't we want to work on concentrations? Why don't we want to work on concentrations? Uh, concentrations, firstly there's several of them. There's the concentration of every species, A, B, C, and D. We're going to work with just a single conversion, one number. Okay, so that's easier to work with. Also concentrations are harder to work with in gas phase. Concentrations in gas phase systems translate over to partial pressures. And I'll show you now in my board, there's many systems where the pressure changes as the reactor, as the reaction proceeds. So your partial pressures change over time, and that's difficult to work with. So numerically, it's easier to work with a single number conversion. It's also something that we're very comfortable with as engineers is to, to relate things to a scale from 0 to 100 and look at that. So in order to derive that, uh, let's take a look at the stoichiometry. So this moves, if you're following the new version of Fogler, this now moves to chapter 4. If you're following the old version of Fogler, this is now section 3.5. So this is where the two textbooks start to diverge at this point. I mean, the content's the same, it's just the chapter number is different for some strange reason. So the approach we're going to follow, we're going to say, let's consider the system where we looked at yesterday, A plus B moles of B has a relationship to C moles of C plus D moles of D. So what we're going to say is we're going to consider A as our basis. So everything's considered on a per mole of A basis. And Tonight I'm going to work with the batch system, but the equations I derive here are no different to those for CSTR and a plug flow reactor. So there's one very minor change to work with those two other reactors, but the derivation is identical. So for a batch reactor, let's just quickly recall, I take my, my system, it's closed, I have well mixed on the inside. I've added several species, I've added Na0 moles of A. And B zero moles of B. There may even be some initial moles of C and some initial moles of D present. And we're going to add in a new feature now that's going to be common for the rest of this course. Is there's always going to be some inert species. So if I'm dealing with gas phase systems, you may have air in there. It's not the action, it's just part of the deal. If you're dealing with liquid phase systems, very often your species that are reacting are dissolved in water or some other solvent. There, that solvent and water is not taking place, but you've got some initial number of holes of that non-reactant species there. So these are all like initial number of holes. And I'm going to define as x is the conversion related to A. So X is simply the number of moles of A. At the end. So when I empty my reactor, after a certain time, number of moles of A that I, I find leaving at the end, divided by the number of moles that I fed initially. Number of moles of A initially added.
let's construct out a very important table that we're going to use regularly through the course. This table is called the stoichiometric table, and it tracks five columns. The first four columns apply to every single system, every single reactor. The first column is the species. The next column is the number of holes you have.
can see the number of moles I have of C <coughs> remaining in the tank at the end is NC naught plus C over A times NA naught X. ND is ND naught plus C over, D over A times NA naught X. And the number of moles remaining of the inner species is the same as what I started off with. But just to emphasize, it's NI naught plus C over A. And the remaining moles in the system, I would call this new value n substitute t, the total number of moles. And that nt is obviously quite messy. It's the sum of all the entries in the column above it. D over A plus C over A minus B over A minus 1. Take the NA naught factor out of the end of the Because of that messy term, I'm going to define a new term here called delta for that set of stoichiometric coefficients. <coughs> So in another way we can say the total number of moles at the end is nt is nt naught plus delta times na naught x. And delta is an important number, especially in gas phase systems. <coughs> it gives us an idea of how much the system expands and contracts by. Remember this is a batch reactor. So we're putting all our ingredients in it, the reaction occurs and goes to some completion or equilibrium, and we end up with this total number of moles. <coughs> Let's take a look at some examples to emphasize that point. The first is the famous water gas shift reaction that takes carbon monoxide and water in its vapor form. So all of this is in the vapor phase. It goes to CO2 plus hydrogen. It's a mildly exothermic reaction and extremely important in the petroleum industry. So what would delta be for this system? Delta is equal to zero. It's one minus, uh, plus one, minus one, minus one. Okay. So it says to us that the NT at the end, in that batch system, is the same number of moles that I start with. Even though the system reacts, I'm simply exchanging one type of mole <coughs> in molecular form for another molecular form. There's no change in the total number of moles from beginning to end. That's a critical point, because let's take a look at a system where that doesn't hold. One is uh, this system over here. Let's take four molecules of ammonia plus three of oxygen, and that's actually in equilibrium with two moles of nitrogen and six moles of water. So again, another gas phase reaction. What is delta in this instance? One. Minus one. 3.7. <laughs> Minus seven. Okay, delta is, let's work through it systematically. We've got the formula D over A, six quarters, quarters plus two quarters, minus three quarters, minus one is equal to a quarter. The key point is positive. So NT at the end is going to be larger than you started off with, NT naught. So NT naught plus and A naught is positive, X is positive quantity, delta is positive quantity, so NT is going to exceed NT naught. Here's 
another important example. This was uh, nitric oxide. We looked at this formula last night. So 2NO plus oxygen reacts in equilibrium and forms 2NO2. What's delta in this instance? perspective, you do not draw a vacuum into a closed vessel. The vessel can withstand pressure and hold its walls, but vacuum almost never. It will implode. Okay? So be aware of this fact that you're going to have to provide some pressure relief on this vessel. Some way for that vacuum to be broken if you're operating in a closed system, which is what our assumption is here. We've got a batch system <coughs> putting a certain amount of species and let, let it go. This is telling me the final number of moles is going to be less than what I started off with. Under the ideal gas law, the number of moles is directly proportional to the volume occupied by those moles and the pressure occupied by those. So this is indicating to me that the pressure in the system is going to go down as the reaction progresses. Okay, so and then another famous example of, of a negative is the the ammonia reaction. So two mole, uh, one mole of nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen gets you two moles of NH3. So you can that's another another example of the negative. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this table now, and let's get our connection where I'm going. Here is eventually we would want some we want some concentrations. Okay, so let's call this concentration. Make a key note here, assume V is V naught. What I mean by that is we're going to make the assumption that we're operating under constant volume. <coughs> so this last column <coughs> applies only in specific cases where the volume of the system remains <coughs> constant. In those cases, we can write the following CA <coughs> is equal to NA over V. But we've seen here that Na, the number of moles remaining at the end, is Na naught times 1 minus x. Divided by 1. Now, if V is equal to V naught, I can write that as Ca is equal to Na over V naught, which is equal to Na naught. 1 minus the conversion divided by V naught. So therefore, CA is equal to CA naught times 1 minus X. That's the important equation. And we've seen that before for the case of constant volume. So up here in my table, I can write the concentration at the end, the CA is CA naught times 1 minus x. <coughs> the equations for B and C and D are a little bit messier, but not too hard to work with. Let's just work carefully through CB, and then the others will follow naturally from that. So CB's final concentration at the end is equal to, let's take a look here, NB naught minus B over A, NA naught times X. So CB, which by definition is the number of moles of B divided through by the volume, that's NB naught 
minus b over a na naught times x divided two by b naught. So it's a simple substitution from what this table's entry is for the final column, the final number of moles divided by the mole. How are we going to repeat that before we No, we're going to relax that next class. <coughs> next week. This assumption is going to go away. And for many liquid systems and for gas systems where the volume doesn't change, this is true. <coughs> so we do a little bit of a mathematical thing here. Multiply it by Na0 over Na0. And that gets me a, a little bit of a simplification here. I can write this then as Na0 brackets and B0 over Na0 minus B over A Na0 over Na0 times X. And that's all divided through by B0. that a little bit. I will write this then as n a naught. And I'll use some new notation here. We'll introduce this ratio of these two concentrations as theta b minus b over a times x. And that's divided through by b naught. I can write CB, so my final concentration of B is CA0 times theta B minus B over A X, where theta B is equal to NB0 over NA0. So it's just a, a helpful uh, new notation to simplify some of these entries in the table. So let's uh, just wrap up then by writing CB is equal to that CA naught theta B minus B over AX. And similarly, we can show that CC is equal to CA naught theta C plus C over AX. And CD is CA naught theta B plus B over A. And your inerts are still your inerts. So we're going to essentially we've really completed everything that we wanted to complete. Um, I said originally my aim was to go and express my rates in terms of conversion. So let's take a look at what we've done tonight and then last night. So we said minus RA is some function of temperature multiplied by some function of concentrations. I've just gone and shown you here how we can express all our concentrations in terms of conversions. Everything else here are constants. CA is constant. Theta B is constant. Lowercase a, b, c, and d, they're all constants. So the only variable here is capital X. So essentially what I've gone and shown you is the link to write that now as a function of X. So we solved our problem. That stoichiometric table is the link to convert our conversions, rewrite our conversions over into conversions. To rewrite our concentrations into conversions. Okay, so next class will show some examples.